Hello, good morning and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Alumide McCauley. The headlines. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky mourns two killed in Pavlora, that, and including a boy killed near a school. Officials count losses of core structures, say 34 injured from an attack in the Dnipro Petrovsk region. Plus, Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky and his Canadian counterpart Justin Trudeau discuss defense cooperation after Russia's multiple overnight strike on various Ukrainian cities. Thank you for joining us this morning. Russia unleashed a fresh volley of missiles on Ukraine overnight in a city in the east, killing two people, setting off huge blazes and damaging dozens of homes and other buildings. Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, announced the two deaths in his nightly video address, vowing in his words, the Russian occupiers will receive answers for every such strike. President Zelensky also said a 14-year-old boy was killed near his school when it was hit by a bomb in the Chernihiv region close to the Russian border. The Donetsk region, the terrorist missiles claimed the lives of two very young men. My condolences go out to the families. 40 others, women, children and men, received aid after having suffered wounds and injuries. President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky. Meanwhile, officials in Pavlorad, 34 people have been wounded according to them and dozens of homes damaged overnight in Russian strikes. According to the Ukrainian military in the district, 80 private residential buildings, nine schools and five shops were affected. Officials add that during the missile attack in the Dnipro Petrovsk region overnight, 24 high-rise buildings were also damaged. The attack on Pavlorod, a city and railway hub, comes during the second wave of nationwide missile strikes in three days, with Moscow apparently reviving its winter tactic of long-range strikes ahead of a planned Ukrainian counter-offensive. In the meantime, the regional administration of Kherson says Russian forces attacked the city eight times with 41 shells over the past 24 hours. The administration said on Telegram Russian forces targeted the building of the state institution. Residential areas were also hit by the shelling. As a result, one person died and three were injured, including a child. An explosion in the Russian Bryansk region bordering Ukraine has derailed a freight train. Russian Railways, the country's rail operator, says the incident occurred at about 10.17 a.m. Moscow time. It says the locomotive and seven freight wagons were derailed and the locomotive caught fire. Bryansk governor Alexander Bogomaz says in a post on his Telegram channel, an unidentified explosive device went off at the 136-kilometer mark on the bryansk unetsha railway line. Russian authorities say the region has been seen multiple attacks by pro-Ukrainian sabotage groups, including the shelling of a village over the weekend, which killed four civilians. A former U.S. Marine, name of Cooper Harris Andrews, has been killed on the outskirts of Bakhmut late last week. That's according to his mother, and that's Willow Andrews and colleagues in Ukraine. 26-year-old Andrews from Cleveland, Ohio, was hit by a mortar, likely on April the 19th, on the so-called Road of Life, the rare access road into Bakhmut used by the Ukrainian military to resupply their forces and also to evacuate civilians. Now, 
It is reported his body has yet to be recovered due to the ongoing fighting around Bakhmut. Andrews worked for an activist group known as the Resistance Committee. According to its social media statements, the group said he was killed assisting the evacuation of civilians from the city. Andrews left Ohio in November and joined the Foreign Legion in Ukraine, a group of foreign fighters helping the Ukrainian military. According to his mother, his contract ended in March, but he decided to stay on. Kiev's top general says Ukraine destroyed Russia's army most combat capable units in Bakhmut. Colonel General Alexander Siriski, Ukraine's commander of ground forces, says in his words, we continue, despite all the forecasts and advice, to hold Bakhmut. We give an opportunity for our reserves to prepare, and we are preparing for further action ourselves. The 10-month-long battle for the eastern Ukrainian city is taking on a symbolic importance for both sides. It has become the fulcrum of a war that has seen little shift in front lines since late 2022, leaving both sides looking for a breakthrough. On Monday, Zariski says that Ukrainian units have ousted Russian forces from some positions in Bakhmut amidst fierce battles, while the Russian Wagner Group says that his units incrementally advanced there at the loss of 86 of his fighters. Meanwhile, Russian news agency TASS says a drone was shot down in the west of Crimea. The Russian head of the Republic said in a post that a UAV was shot down by air defense forces in the west of Crimea. Our servicemen, in his words, solve tasks clearly and effectively. I ask everyone to remain calm and trust only trusted sources of information. Now, the head of the Wagner private militia renewed his appeal to Russia's defense ministry to increase ammunition shipments to his fighters trying to seize the city of Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine. Yevgeny Prigozhin has frequently clashed with Moscow's defense establishment over the conduct of Russia's campaign in Ukraine and what he says is insufficient support being provided to his Wagner soldiers. In a video posted on his Telegram channel, Prigozhin says he needs at least 300 tons of artillery shells a day for the assault. Bakhmut, which had a pre-war population of over 70,000, has been leveled by months of artillery shelling and urban combat between Russian and Ukrainian soldiers. Prigozhin claimed on April the 11th, his forces, which are leading the assault, controlled more than 80% of the city. Wagner is not part of Russia's official armed forces, and Prigozhin has previously accused the Defense Ministry of betraying his fighters and Russia's overall war aims by not providing sufficient ammunition. Now, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has spoken to his Canadian counterpart, Justin Trudeau, and discussed defense cooperation and increased sanctions. On Twitter, the Ukrainian president says, they noted the beginning of the Russian assets confiscation and called for increased sanction pressure on Russia. He adds that they also discussed coordinated positions on the eve of the NATO summit and other international events. Now let's talk to Professor Victoria Sarida, Senior Fellow, Farm of Transregional Studies, Senior Researcher, National Academy of Science, Ukraine, joining us from Berlin in Germany. It's good to have you with us this morning. Morning. Could we begin with the latest strikes and also condolences and commiseration to uh, the people involved with the casualties that have been recorded, even on both sides. And the latest one in the Pavlograd district, where 80 private residential buildings and nine schools and five shops were affected. This is coming just before the expected counteroffensive by Ukraine. What's your general impression as we begin of uh, Russia's aggression at this hour? 
Unfortunately, uh, this this is a shocking weekend for Ukrainian civilians and for for Ukrainians, since this uh, there were several waves of uh, missile attacks on on different parts of the country, including the central part of the of the country. Uh, Umen, for example, and we know that uh, people who are fleeing uh, from the regions with uh, active mil military uh, uh, with military activities are actually staying in the center or in the west of the country. They're seeking refugees there. So uh, in this case, uh, it's not only those regions we are, which are close to uh, potential military operations were hit, but also very central part of the country. And this creates a situation where, first of all, people don't know where to flee, where to hide. Uh, we, we have a situation when a lot of people who are staying abroad also were thinking uh, that uh, for quite a, some time uh, there were not very intensive uh, missile strikes uh, from Russia. So they started thinking about returning back at least to those safe parts of the country. And now uh, this is again uh, shown that uh, we don't have any safe spots in the country. In certain areas, 15 of 18 missile strikes uh, yesterday were thwarted by Ukraine's defense forces. And knowing that they've just taken delivery of the Patriot missile system from the United States. How much does this help in their defense and their offensives? Uh, there was uh, another comment by U.S. military uh, um, officials that actually, uh, yes, Ukraine does have a Patriot systems, but at the same time, if Ukraine is thinking about the counteroffensive uh, operation, then it has to think of safe uh, those Patriot uh, uh, systems for military operation. And then there is a big uh, moral dilemma or question for Ukrainian military. Uh, if Ukrainian cities are, are hit, should they defend them? And definitely they, they are defending Ukrainian cities, uh, which, which creates a situation when, when these uh, missiles are spared or used for uh, saving civilians' lives in, instead of pre preparing for counteroffensive operation. That is an interesting dilemma. Um, for the United States, uh, who, according to them, say that 20,000 Ukrainian, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, Russian soldiers have been killed and 100,000 casualties on the Russian side though he declined to say, according to those declassified sources, that uh, how many Ukrainian forces have uh, been affected casualty-wise. We hear reports that, and could you confirm this, if you will, or if you have any uh, information for us, that for every one Russian soldier killed, seven Ukrainian soldiers are affected. Unfortunately, we don't have numbers uh, in, in Ukraine. We do not have official sources. Uh, the comments we have from uh, uh, official uh, military uh, government people in Ukraine uh, are the opposite. They quite often comment that in, for every uh, one, one Ukrainian soldier is killed for or wounds for every 10 Ukrainian soldiers. But of course, those who are experts uh, on military operations, they more or less uh, say, say or know that the ratio is one to three. Those who are defending uh, usually have less smaller losses and those who are uh, doing a, oper uh, uh, who are uh, uh, Offen uh, offense, doing offense, they, are, they, they have three times as much. And if we are to expect a Ukrainian counteroffensive operation, then there will be a huge question about the number of possible losses. Professor Victoria, if I am a Russian convicted felon, uh, serving, for instance, 20 years to life for murder, and I'm approached by Wagner Mercenary Group to 
joined the forces of Wagner to attack Ukraine. After which, if I perform my duties, then my slate is wiped clean. I'm forgiven and pardoned for all my offenses. And I go forth and I, and I fight for Wagner Group. Given that Wagner uh, has a lot of, most of the, according to John Kirby, uh, the US official, most of the casualties on the Russian side are the Wagner soldiers. How much of, uh, is it helping uh, the Wagner Group? Is it helping Russia that they're using prisoners uh, criminals and convicted felons as mercenaries to fight against Ukraine? Is it working against them rather than for them? It helps uh, because it, it probably, we would assume it helps first of all uh, for the military forces which are tr well trained uh, because they would save more lives for military well trained uh, soldiers. And at the same time, it helps if, for example, the, the te technology uh, they are using for taking Bakhmut or some other regions is that they have very intensive uh, waves of uh, attacking by, by, by people. And actually, this technology was already used uh, by Soviet Union in, during the Second World War. If mm. you look at the losses of uh, different nations had uh, during the Second World War, uh, Soviet Union had the same times more than any other nation. Uh, so they are using those technologies again uh, with when uh, lives are not so much important, especially uh, claiming that, that these are lives of convicts. Or, uh, and they are using th th this technology to advance and only after after those several waves of uh, Wagner troops, for example, other military units are coming in and uh, helping to storm different facilities or uh, pla places in the city. Right, Professor, you're in Berlin and last month, or rather in February, uh, at Brandenburg Gate and other locations, there were demonstrations by Germans who are anti-giving Ukraine assistance anymore with weapons. They're against the German government. They want uh, Olaf Scholz to stop, uh, the, the, especially the, the left, uh, leftist movement in Germany. They are vehemently against it, and there were demonstrations, some figures, according to police, 13,000 unofficial sources say 50,000 as much in different locations in Germany protesting Germany's involvement in the war. In the same breath, there are Germans who, in Germany, are supporting the government's position on the war. Could you enlighten us on whether an anti-war sentiment is brewing enough in Germany to sway the government of the day? Um, not really. Uh, in, as in any democratic country, uh, uh, you have different parties, you have different uh, views, and uh, people have a right and possibility to express their opinions. Uh, so uh, we do have uh, in Germany a wide spectrum of, of uh, parties, and different parties have different level of support uh, or different stance on what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, and one of them is, uh, for example, the Linke leftist party, which supports uh, more pro-peace uh, activism. And uh, they, are, they were organizing the marches uh, in support of anti-weapon and pro-peace uh, uh, during, and this is also, uh, actually also a tradition in Germany, then uh, after the Easter, uh, uh, they would march, depending on the political situation in the world, uh, pro-peace uh, in different countries, and in, in this case, uh, this is Ukraine. Uh, however, if you if you take numbers, these numbers are not extremely high, uh, because if you are saying that even uh, if you count 50,000 uh, from uh, 80 million population, then this is a small share of people. Uh, 
uh, of course, it's important to have a discussion. And even if Ukraine is uh, uh, receiving military aid, for example, from Germany, just a few days ago, uh, Scholz uh, commented that uh, Ukraine can use these weapons, which is given uh, by uh, Germany, only on the territory of Ukraine. So no uh, aims can be hit on the Russian territory. There's an interesting story, Professor, that occurred concerning the U.S. Marine, uh, Marine who was killed uh, while being a part of the Foreign Legion in Ukraine. Now, given that, for instance, the French resistance was very important and reported on in World War II, and the Foreign Legion is operating in Ukraine with nationals from other countries who are sympathetic. They come from their own country of their own volition. In this case, the Marine unfortunately lost his life. Are, you seeing, are we seeing more uh, nations and people, in, individuals in nations coming to join the war effort of their own volition to help Ukraine against the Russian aggression? I think that we see this on both sides, and uh, I, we also know that it very much depends on, on the can, uh, country legislation, because certain countries does not allow their citizens to participate uh, in uh, military operations of third, of third parties. And we've had recently case of uh, Kazakhstan uh, citizens who were sentenced in Kazakhstan for the participation of, uh, in this uh, military uh, campaign on the side of, of uh, Russian side, uh, militaries. So uh, we do have different nationals supporting uh, different sides, but it depends on, on the national legislation. If the country allows uh, this type of activities and people uh, have their internal uh, inner moves to support, then they can join. Professor, unequivocal departure from Ukraine's territory is the bedrock of any negotiation, according to President Zelensky. For those who criticize him uh, and those who criticize the war and are really miffed that it has gotten to this point, uh, such as Brazil, Brazil's president, who has recently said that both sides should come to the negotiating table. China, who seem to have changed their posture a bit more uh, in support of negotiations. What is your impression of the president of Ukraine's position on negotiating with Russia to bring an end to the war? I think that we have to to remember that Ukraine does uh, many steps, uh, smaller steps. Uh, for example, we have a grain deal, which was negotiated by Turkey, uh, and it uh, works with with some questions, of course, but still uh, some grain from Ukraine is delivered to those countries which are. Uh, greatly in need uh, of uh, food supplies, specifically who depends on the grain. Uh, uh, there are a lot of exchanges uh, of uh, prisoners, uh, or military uh, war prisoners between the countries, but it is not possible to start these negotiations if you are shelled uh, on almost a daily basis and if you have civilians who are killed uh, in, in big numbers and civilian infrastructure is shelled. And we know that shelling civ civilian infrastructure, this is a uh, war crime. We also know what is happening right now on occupied territories of uh, our country when uh, Putin signed a new decree uh, declaring that all people who are living on those territories should acquire Russian citizenship. Uh, and if they do not acquire Russian citizenship, they can be accused uh, of uh, not supporting the, the Russian government. And for this reason, they could be deported. Professor, there are secret negotiations taking place to help bring some sort of um, conciliation, according to the Pope. So the Vatican says they're involved. 
now in trying to mediate. Uh, the Pope spoke of efforts to, to help in this regard. How much of an influence do you think the Vatican will have with Russia? Um, first of all, we have uh, a lot of different leaders, uh, foreign leaders, trying to uh, use this as a as a political power leverage card. Um, China uh, also declared that they 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 make steps and efforts to bring to, uh, this war to the end. Turkey very much, especially uh, Turkey right now is facing the elections. There are a lot of discussions and, uh, and in media discourse we also have this, that Turkey is trying to negotiate peace. Now we have a pope, but at the same time uh, we know that uh, a bigger part of Ukraine is Orthodox uh, and only small, smaller parts are Catholic or Greek Catholic. Uh, and there is a big question what influence this will have, especially uh, with our Ukrainian government commenting that uh, this uh, mission was not negotiated uh, with Ukraine. Ukraine doesn't know about the content of the mission. And uh, as a Western uh, alliance, uh, EU and US uh, constantly stress that there should be no peace talks without Ukraine involved. Yes, you're quite correct. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church is not under the Catholic Church. So, um, therefore, but the Pope in his capacity as, as the leader of the Catholic Church uh, is, tr is trying to make this happen. It's interesting you mentioned that there are other leaders in other countries who have their own problems to attend to, and there are political considerations, I expect, that is driving some of these mediations. Where would you like to see uh, the most efforts? From which country, perhaps, do you think that maybe they're not doing enough uh, to, to help Ukraine? I think uh, in this case, uh, I don't see a possibility that one single country can ne negotiate peace. I, I do believe that if uh, a new world order or new uh, establishment should be reached, then this would be uh, the global discussion, which includes uh, different uh, continents and uh, representatives uh, from from different parts of the world who can uh, renegotiate the, the power uh, situation in, in the global context. So uh, I do not believe that one single player can, can do this. However, I do believe that uh, Pope possibly could negotiate some support of uh, civilians uh, under uh, uh, occupation or maybe some humanitarian steps which are necessary. So mm -hmm. any, anything is welcomed uh, if he could negotiate exchange of population or return of Ukrainian kids. We, we have uh, over 20,000 uh, kids which were deported uh, and by Russia. Uh, so anything, in, in, even in, in this sphere of, of uh, humanitarian aid would be very much welcomed. Thank you. 433 days of this conflict is one day too many. Thank you, Victoria Sarida, Senior Fellow, Firm of Transregional Studies, Senior Researcher, National Academy of Science, Ukraine, who joined us from Berlin. Thank you for being a part of the conversation this morning. Thank you. After the break, EU State's Chief Prosecutor Ivan Geshev targeted by bomb attack. Bulgarian authorities vow to find the culprits. Details in a moment. Welcome back. Authorities in Sofia have said Bulgarian Prosecutor General Ivan Geshev was the target of an assassination attempt yesterday where a roadside bomb detonated as Geshev's motorgate was driving by.
according to Deputy Prosecutor General Borislav Sarafov. The incident happened at about 11.45 local time as Gashev was returning to Sofia from nearby Samakov as his motorcade made a tight turn. The bomb planted by the side of the road went off. Sarafov says the bomb was intended to kill, not to intimidate. He says the device was stuffed with sharpnel and had the equivalent of three kilograms of TNT in the explosives. The explosion left a crater four meters wide and 40 centimeters deep but miraculously, no one was injured. The Interior Ministry has opened a terrorism investigation and vowed to track down the perpetrators. Geshev has been Bulgaria's chief prosecutor since November 2019. Before that, he was a deputy chief prosecutor and head of the Special Prosecutor's Office. Both his appointment and his tenure have been marked by controversy. A large blimp developed by the Chinese military has been spotted for the first time at a remote base in the desert of northwestern China. Aerospace experts say the image, taken three months before a Chinese spy balloon was shot down off the coast of South Carolina in the United States, could signal a notable advancement in China's airship program, demonstrating a more versatile and maneuverable craft than previously seen or known. The image is taken in November 2022 by U.S. satellite imaging company Black Sky, shows a roughly 100-foot-long blimp in the middle of a nearly kilometer-long runway at a desert military complex in northwestern China. Oklahoma Aerospace Institute Executive Director Jamie Jacobs says a blimp like this could be used as a submarine of the skies and that it appears to have dedicated propulsion and navigation capabilities which will allow it to loiter over an area for an extended period. However, a senior Defense Department official declined to comment on what threats the blimp represents in China's arsenal but says since its visuals or since it was visible, the Pentagon would be aware. Now we're pleased to speak with Major General Pat Akem Wenger, military strategist, former commander, full mechanized brigade, Benin City, joining us from our Abuja studios in the Federal Capital Territory. It's good to have you on the program, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Lumide. Now, I'd like to begin with the Wagner uh, chief, Prigozhin, who has been speaking of the of their need of the mercenary group to have more ammunition. Now he's doing this on his tele telegram channel and he's asking for more ammunition. He's complaining it's, it's in the public domain. Is this um, the channel that he's supposed to go through? And if he's already speaking with the Russians officially, what does this say of the Wagner mercenary group who constitute the arrowhead of the Russian offensive right now and their relations with Russia's military. Yeah, um, the head of the Wagner group has been having a running battle with Ministry of Defense officials. Uh, he has insisted that uh, he's been sabotaged. There appears to be some other currents of tension and competition, unheady competition going on. Um, the, the regular forces uh, welcome his help, but he also takes the shine off what they are doing. Uh, so, and then, of course, when you are fighting in a place like uh, Bakhmut that they want to take by all means, and you are expending ammunition at the rate they are expending, uh, you will require a constant supply, like a stream flowing through effortlessly to the front. But that is not happening. Uh, so he says he needs like uh, 4,000, uh, or 40, I think 4,000 uh, of certain kind of ammunition to be expended daily. Yeah, he's getting far less than that. Um, the way they are fighting, they, they throw in a lot, of, uh, a lot of firepower to try to advance uh, incrementally. So, yeah, he needs a lot of ammunition, and he's not getting what he thinks he requires. Uh, so the, uh, perhaps the channels of communication between him and and the defense forces uh, appear not to be too clear, so he's passing information through the Telegram channel to, uh, to get attention, virtually crying for attention. Uh, that's what happens when you have unconventional forces fighting a war. 
are those kind of things, the, the lack of discipline and all that it takes place. So I think that's why it's happening. Major General, um, I posed a question to our last guest, and I put myself in the first person of a prisoner in Russia's prisons who's been given a lifeline of a pardon by participating in the mercenary group. The mercenaries are soldiers of fortune. They're doing it for the money. How does such a person, how is such a person relied on on the battlefield, given that he's a criminal, a career criminal in most cases, and some of them have even, when they were allowed to, when they did their bit and they were allowed to go back home, pardoned, they went and committed more crimes. How do, how do the commanders rely on such an individual who has such a background to be a soldier to prosecute a war? The outcome will be this mass we've seen. Uh, normally you use forces that are well trained, uh, well cultured, with a military culture to be able to, and traditions, uh, the nomad professional training to be able to execute the kind of uh, battle plans that you have for taking a city like Bakhmut or any other city for that matter. So when you see mercenaries uh, who have come in directly from prison, they have, first and foremost, their morale will be low. Uh, they are caught between the river and the deep blue sea. Do, do I stay in prison or do I go to fight? The risk of fighting is very high. Do I even have an option? Uh, we're only hearing what we're being told. Perhaps they are even being forced to fight. So uh, it's like getting some conscripts, forcing them into battle. Uh, people, troops actually fight for nations. Uh, nations they believe in. So when you're bringing prisoners and forcing them to fight, you will get some kind of performances, but not at the level you will expect. Uh, so they are dying in large numbers. In fact, I understand that they are called expendable materials. So they die in large numbers. They are caught between the devil and the deep blue sea, except that one of the, the maybe the, the deep blue sea is even more difficult. So uh, yeah, they have no option but to fight. And that is why we are getting the kind of, they are getting the kind of outcomes they are getting. Um, it's been very difficult taking Bakhmut. Uh, I understand they occupy about 87% of the city now, but there are key roads that lead into the city and out, out, uh, outwards that they've not been able to control. So the motivation will be low, professionalism will be lacking, uh, you will expand the kind of ammunition they are expanding because they will fire uncontrollably. So that is, uh, that is what happens when you use people like that to fight. <laughs> Major General, does it matter in a war when information such as you just reminded us the number of ammunition that they required or they requested of Russia's military is published online and the enemy knows how much you need, except in the case of disinformation. In this war, there's been a lot of information that is, that is in the public space. Well except it's for disinformation. How does this help either side? Given that, for instance, counteroffensive has been uh, touted for the past month by Ukraine. They say we're going to attack. Um, the Wagner chief said, even gave a date and said that from today, May the 2nd, Ukraine is likely to launch an attack. Is there too much information going around for, for this side for a realistic outcome or that's how, it, that's how it happens. Oh, well, you know, the, the world has changed drastically. Uh, these days, uh, information, information flow is just, 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 just there. So, and, and then again, you know, there's a lot of lack of professionalism going on here. Uh, even conventional forces have been found in Russia to be using communication channels mm -hmm. and, and equipment that they were not supposed to be using. So information leaks, and apart from that, America has access to information on a scale that we didn't know existed before. You will recall that while this war was being planned, America kept hinting, signposting it, just laying it out there that they are going to, even when, when operations were planned uh, in a manner that would cause confusion, America had information. And they are not the only ones. The Western intelligence uh, assets are being de deployed to get as much as possible. So the Wagner guy knows that nothing really is hidden here. And then again, he's not a professional. Uh, so he talks. Mm -hmm. and 
Uh, he, he talks carelessly. He talks anytime he wants to talk. He, he just says anything. But again, uh, a lot of disinformation too is going on. I would like to touch on the counteroffensive that has been planned. This counteroffensive has been in the pipeline for so long that uh, <clears throat> it's, it, it has not been launched, but it's losing steam, so to speak. And the last attack on Pablo Grad appears to have uh, dented the plans in a massive way. Uh, mm. the, the kind of secondary explosions we saw indicated that that was the storage of heavy as arsenals in preparations for the counteroffensive. And perhaps the, the, the Russia got hint of it and took out those assets. It, it, it will require a lot of logistic engineering to get th those kind of uh, arsenal that will, will get the counteroffensive going. So this counteroffensive not likely to take place in the next, next couple of months. And the more they wait, the more the, the tension between the political leadership and the military leadership in Ukraine, the more they wait, the more they lose the kind of support they are getting from Western nations. So uh, the events of the last couple of days have, have actually set the war back on, from the, uh, the, the Ukrainian side. I think the counteroffensive has just so far a massive setback. Sir. Given your military background, I'd like you to enlighten us. Uh, the, the United States has been silent on the allegations that there are special forces from the UK and from the United States and some other nations sympathetic to the Ukrainian cause who have been deployed into Ukraine. We don't know. That is according to the leak of the Pentagon documents, which states that. And, uh, of course... Could you give us an insight into how this affects the war, given that Russia's special forces were already said to have been uh, the first uh, group of forces that were being used to start this war? And we don't know whether they're SAS from the UK, we don't know whether they're Navy SEALs from America or any other of their special forces. But if that was the case and these forces were being used to train the Ukrainians, how does that, what, what, what kind of color does that bring to the, to the combat scene? <laughs> yeah, there, there have been a, a lot of red lines that the Russians had drawn that have been crossed by Western, Western nations, uh, which, and this is one of it. Uh, but again, you know, these are not forces who are engaged in active combat. They are, they are doing, they are giving advisory services, they are conducting trainings. I understand America has about 14. The highest is uh, UK, uh, which has 50. So they are, they are too small to, to be used in combat roles. They are, they are conducting trainings. They are conduct, giving advisory services. But again, it's one of those red lines that the Russians had drawn, uh, the involvement of ground forces of any texture would, would attract uh, some serious actions. Uh, the information has been out there. We heard a couple of noises made. But nothing drastic from the Russian perspective, not from the Russian angle, not, nothing came, uh, came, came forth by way of reprisals or uh, countermeasures. Um, apart from uh, maybe, maybe discussions on the diplomatic uh, level, nothing much. So it's true, uh, because none of the nations have denied, it's true that uh, there are troops from other nations, but again, they will tell you they're not involved in combat. So uh, it's permitted to some extent. Uh, I think that's why it's happening there. The EU Major General has said that the 95% of the weapons and equipment promised have been delivered to Ukraine as they contemplate this offensive, which we don't know when it's going to happen. Do you think the Ukrainians have had enough time to train to use these weapons? When you are, when you are fighting a war and conducting trainings uh, at the same time, it's normally Mm. An ad hoc kind of thing. Uh, the, the troops must get get the basic training they need and then learn the rest on the on the battlefield. So I think that is what is happening. Uh, but I'm suspecting that that counteroffensive has suffered a very massive setback. The explosions we heard yesterday from Palo Grad uh, mm. indicated that huge storage of ammunition and equipment were were destroyed. I think that because they, they didn't execute the counteroffensive on time, the Russian intelligence assets were able to intercept and know that uh, those logistics, heavy logistics were stored in those places, and they took them out. So it will take a large scaling up of logistics supplies from Western nations, NATO and other allies, 
to get the build up to the level where counter, uh, counter offensive will be launched. So for now, I think they will just stay in that back mode, uh, get the Russians bogged down there, keep defending. Uh, counter offensive is not likely to come very quickly. Uh, and, and of course, when you, uh, like I said before, when you are training troops uh, with new equipment in an ongoing war, the best they can get are basic trainings. Uh, to, then they do the rest on the field as they begin to use them. So I think that's why it's taking place right now. Uh, learning on the job with, uh, with yeah, weapons like that. that uh, on the job. Yeah, on that, well, on that scale is, is a scary thought. But Major General, it's been described as a stalemate, this conflict. For the Ukrainians, it's been described by some as a losing effort on the part of the Russians because they didn't know it was going to last this long. That is the impression uh, that people have, that President Putin didn't anticipate the sort of resistance from the Ukrainians. What's your impression of the state of the war? A stalemate or is Russia losing? I think the two descriptions you've given can squarely fit into the Russian narrative. First, Russia has always been touted as one of the greatest uh, war powers, superpowers, in terms of military power. They were ranked only second to, to, to the Americans. Mm. Um, this war has exposed vulnerabilities and weaknesses that we never expected. Uh, from a military perspective, and as a military person, I can tell you that I wasn't expecting this at all. I, I expected this to be a quick operation that at most was going to last a couple of weeks. But again, war has changed dramatically, and so the, the Davids of this world can also kill the Goliaths of the world. So basically, um, 433 days ongoing, no major shifts, so that description of it as a stalemate persists and is true. It's a stalemate. I can't see anyone giving a knockout punch. Uh, at best, Russia is holding its, the territories they captured uh, to perhaps use them later as leverage to negotiate. But again, Ukraine doesn't want to, to trade, trade off any of its territory. So we are going to be there for a long while. And Russia counts on the fact that uh, where Ukraine is depending on support from Western nations, and Western nations will get tired. So yeah, they are playing the wrong game. Uh, they've not gotten the, 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 the results they envisaged from the outst uh, at the outstart of the war. But again, basically, stay there, keep fighting. Um, Russia has a better hand. Uh, they are able to produce things on their own, depending on some allies here and there, but basically using their equipment. Uh, Ukraine, on the other part, does not have the, the way with that to, to keep uh, expanding munitions and weapons at the level they are, they are, uh, that are currently ongoing without support from outside. So Russia has a better hand, but if you're looking at the scale of the capabilities that we expected, uh, Ukraine has, has done a fantastic job. Finally, Major General, do you see this as escalating to the point of a world war? We can see the posture of different countries. Nobody wants a world war. No, nobody wants that to happen. Even the, <laughs> exactly, even, even, even those in the United States, for instance, uh, we know that President Biden is getting ready for an election this year for which is declared an intention to run. And we know what's happening in Turkey with the government there. We know what's happening with Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel with the problems he has with his judiciary reform. And in Hungary, even Viktor Orban has problems in his own country, uh, politically speaking, as these people hold on to power. Do you think this will ever become a greater conflict? Well, any military analyst who tells you they know, they, they have they know what will happen going forward will be lying. Uh, let me say this, mistakes happen in war. Mm. So when you are fighting and there are interests like this, anything can happen. But on the normal level, viewed from the, the postures of nation now, I don't think any nation wants to get, I think that it will be scared that when it gets to the level where it could become a world war. I, I, I think what is going on is a proxy war between the West and Russia. And it, uh, China doesn't want to get too deeply involved. A couple of nations have sat it out. So basically to get, uh, to get a world war, we, we be that some mistakes are not in the sage at a scale that rises to that would have occurred. And I don't think that is going to happen. Um, Russia has been very, very careful. They make noise about using 
nuclear weapons, maybe tactical weapons. They've even moved, uh, hinted at moving some to Belarus. Uh, but I think that is just posturing. Russia is not going to use nuclear weapons because nobody wins. Nuclear weapons are what we call mutually assured destruction. Uh, and if you have a, a, a second strike capability like most nations have, you hit me, I hit you back. Uh, so nobody will, will do that. Uh, so I am not expecting this thing to rise to this level where it will spill over and become a world war. Um, I think it will continue at this level. Uh, prosy fights. Uh, Mutual. It's already a prosy war. And that is why I think that it will go on for a long while because nobody wants to lose. Uh, Russia, if Ukraine is defeated, America is defeated. Uh, and, and NATO appear to be defeated. So it will continue on this trajectory for a long Mutual while. Mutual assured destruction. That's my take. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mutually assured destruction, yes. <laughs> yes, that, that appears to be the way that will go. Thank you, sir. Major General Pat mm -hmm. Akim Finger, military strategist, former commander, former mechanized brigade, Benin City, joined us from Abuja. Thank you for your insights on the issue. Thank you so much. Thanks. Ukraine's ambassador to Ireland, Larissa Garasco, has called for a boycott of Jameson whiskey after the brand became available, albeit to a limited degree on the Russian market. Jameson, owner by the, rather owned by the French company Pernod Ricard, resumed sales in Russia late last year, citing the need to protect its local teams as well as avoid facing legal trouble over intentional bankruptcy in the country. Garasco, however, has projected such a rationale, rejected that rationale, calling for a boycott of the brand until it withdraws completely from Russia. The ambassador vowed to stop purchasing Jameson products and called on ordinary consumers as well as restaurants and pubs to follow suit. Garasco claimed she tried to raise the issue directly with the manufacturer weeks ago but received no response. Now, finally, the Ukrainian Judo Federation has said Ukrainian judokists will not take part in this month's World Judo Championships in Qatar following the International Judo Federation IGF decision to readmit Russians and Belarusians as neutrals. The International Olympic Committee, the IOC, last month recommended that at least from the two countries be allowed to return to international competition as neutrals. IGF last week announced it'll allow judokas from Russia and Belarus to participate in the May 7th to the 14th championships, saying its decision will allow Russians and Belarusians to participate in qualifying for the 2024 Olympic Games in Paris. IOC's recommendations exclude athletes who support the war or are contracted to military or national security agencies. IJF says it has enlisted an independent company to perform background checks and identify any such athletes. However, the Ukrainian Federation alleged that a number of Russian judokas registered for the championships and that they are active servicemen. And this is where, this is where we'll call it a day on Russian invasion today, our special coverage. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Illumide Macaulay. Have a great day and please join us again tomorrow.